Oh, sorry. Good evening, everybody. I call to order the March 29th, 2023 meeting of the Neiman Finance Committee. Um, our first agenda item is, as it always is, um, an opportunity for any citizens to um, address the Finance Committee with any questions they may have for us. And I don't see anyone in the room who wants to take advantage of that. Is there anyone's? No. I don't want to take care of that. There isn't? Okay. We'll move to our next item, which is um, our minutes of our last meeting, which was on March 8th. Um, Luis has uh, prepared the, the minutes and disseminated them to everyone for their review and comment. I don't know if you got any uh, requested changes. Nope. Okay, so do uh, we want to take action on those minutes? I move their approval. Second. Seconded by Jim. Um, since we're on Zoom tonight, we'll do a roll call. So, Carly, I'll start with you. Yes. Here. Okay. Uh, Dick. Yes. And um, sorry. Karen. <laughs> <Here. Darren. laughs> yes. Yes. Carol. Yes. James. Yes. Barry. Yes. Josh. Yes. And the chair votes yes. So we are. Um, those are approved. And now we'll go to um, our back into the town meeting warrant and Article Six Small Repair Grant Program. <coughs> Well, yeah. Okay, so we had a previous discussion on this and we asked for some further information, um, which has been disseminated. Are there any additional questions or items that um, members would like to raise on it? Nope. Well, I'm satisfied with the information that's been provided. Do I hear a motion? Motion to approve. Second. Seconded by um, Luis. Okay. Any further discussion or comment? Hearing none, we'll come to a vote. Carly? I'll do you yes. first on screen. Okay. Luis? Yes. Dick? Yes. Karen? Yes. Carol? Yes. Yeah. Yes. And Barry? Yes. And Josh? Yes. The chair votes yes as well. So. Um, we will recommend that that article six be adopted. Now we turn to the zoning articles with their zone article 17, 18, 19, and 20. I see Adam's here. Welcome. Um, and then Lee is on the screen. Um, and so are you going to be speaking to us on those, Adam? Sure. Please come to the table. So the uh, so we'll start with Article 17. Yes. So Article 17 really comes to us in particular from the ZBA, who has found that in the course of I think the last three years, I think uh, only two three-car garages have been denied. And when I spoke to the chair of the ZBA, it was not because of uh, uh, um, because it was there. Uh, um, my word, it wasn't really because it was a criteria with failing within the um, uh, within the the bylaw. In other words, one member of the ZBA. Uh, didn't like two of them. And with the ZBA, you need a, a consensus vote of three. And if you have, you don't have three, it's not passed. So, uh, but every other circumstance has come about. The challenge with this for the town in particular is sometimes these three car garages will go uh, to a special, uh, they require a special permit. And uh, now we're looking to effectively do it by right in the majority of circumstances, there is a limited circumstance where it would continue to be a special permit, but in the majority of these circumstances it would be by right. Uh, in many instances, these special permit hearings uh, can occur over multiple meetings and can go month after month after month. The problem with that is, as you probably know, uh, um, the ZBA is only staffed, I think, by uh, a part-time staff person in addition to all of the work that they have to do. 
So it becomes it becomes very burdensome for for staff on the one hand, and also becomes very burdensome for the ZBA members themselves, especially in a circumstance where these are in the uh, in all except two circumstances they're approved. The other circumstance is that the homeowner has to pay their attorney's fees and their architect and their engineer in many instances over several meetings. And this is relief for the town, but it's also a significant relief to homeowners um, that wouldn't have to go through as much of that expense in order to be able to achieve the end result that's almost always achieved anyways. So uh, uh, three car garages um, you know, have become a bit of a thing, especially in the SRB district. And so, um, so there have been some design standards in order to uh, break up the massing on a house and to uh, allow for them in, in certain circumstances uh, with this uh, uh, by, um, by right when they're set back two feet from the rest of the house or if they're on the side and so on. So if, uh, and if they're, uh, yes, that's correct. And then if there's gonna be a scenario where for some reason the homeowner is so um, uh, um, is so insistent that the three car garages have no break in the front wall of the house. That's when they would need to come for a special permit. So the anticipation is that this structure would diminish what many regard as an, a, a less favorable design aesthetic. So. Um, and then that circumstance would require a special permit. Yes, I didn't see in the language you're pointing to where it talks about the special permit provision in the SRB if it's not conforming to the other requirements. And four car garages in the uh, um, SRA. Um, the way that we're constructing this, we, do you want to speak to that? You're muted, Lee. Could you please repeat the question so I can answer it succinctly? Um, maybe, maybe I found it in the, the special permit section. Uh, I thought that was only applicable to single residence A, but there is also single residence B. That's where that's the yeah, thing. Exactly. Yes, right. I mean, in single residence A, you're allowed to have a three car garage by right, and you're you're basically allowed the fourth car um, by special permit. So I guess uh, my my question is: Is this does this, does this have any financial impact on it? Um, no. Except not not in a, a significant way at all. Um, you know the the impacts that I was really were thinking about is that it eases the burden on you know the board members and the staff department, but that's that's all. Can I can ask a question aside from the financial? Um, locating garages in the basement of dwellings and access by means of a ramp. Do we have a lot of those right now in Eden? There are for three cars. Not, I don't know if there's any, uh, but I can't speak to that. I can't confirm that. I just don't. I haven't done the town hasn't done an audit on the number of three car garages down a ramp. I guess it really builds up. It depends on how this is designed and there is a hill, or mm -hmm. it's probably more likely that that would occur. Yeah, yeah I don't have a question. I have them stylistically. Paragraph number three refers to new language underlined, and I don't see anything underlined. Is there no new language? That is a holdover from a, a, a internal documentation. Is that correct, Lee? Well, if you're looking at paragraph three, there is new language underlined in the single in the uh, single in the single residence A uh, district, conservation and institutional districts. I'm, I'm I'm a little confused. I'm looking at what I submitted for the warrant, um, and I'm seeing under paragraph three a portion of the paragraph which begins with the word "upon application" with underlying in it. You don't have that on your document. It's not underlined here. No. <laughs> well, I'm not sure what happened then. Um, um, that's it's on the document I submitted to. 
the select board. So I'll, 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 I'm going to review the final warrant. So it is underlined. What's underlined is the phrase in that paragraph, which begins with um, the small one um, that's underlined. Um, and then the words in the single residence, a rural residence conservation and institutional districts for a total of four car garage spaces or to one additional garage space per lot in the single residence B general residence business and institutional districts for a total of three garage spaces, notwithstanding that the garage space is not permitted under the paragraph above. So that's what was added to that paragraph. I'll, I'll, I'll follow up with the select board. I'm not sure how that happened. <laughs> Mr. Chair, I just have one question on all these zoning articles. Um, do we have an opinion that they have a financial implication or since this is my second tour of duty here, so I'm not sure how you, how the finance committee has, has moved forward on these things you know, over the past 10 years or so, but is this something you still comment on anyway, or what, how does that We only comment on it if we vote to adopt it or not to vote it, but not to adopt it. If we take the position that there's no discernible financial impact, therefore we're not recommending or not recommending, we don't speak to it. Okay. And so have we decided that, we, that this is, does have so, one? So what we do is we take them on an article by article basis yeah. and have a discussion and ask the question like mm -hmm. I did there with this one. Right. I think, for example, on ADUs, we'll have a, maybe a more robust discussion about whether they have a financial impact or not. But I asked the question on this one. I don't see yeah. that this one does, oh, but why? Louise in particular oftentimes thinks that-, that Yeah, that, I think uh, this one's hard to, to figure out whether or not there is any. Right. So we yeah. do it on an article by article basis. Okay. I, I tend to be more liberal in my interpretation. Right. Um, right. So, <laughs> so, does, uh, so, Louise, maybe we can take advantage of you in this instance. Uh, maybe not being so liberal. Can you, can you make a, a motion with respect to? Uh, yes. Um, I move that the finance committee not take a position on Article 17 because um, we had special language where we couldn't discern what the financial impact. There's no obvious discernible no financial mentioned. impact. Yeah. yeah. Second. What's my question? With the special language. If Josh, <laughs> what, does allowing these additional garages impact the value of houses? Which would impact value. Which given that uh, if they go through the process, they eventually get them anyhow. I think is the point. Exactly. <laughs> Although there may be more of them if it's as of right. <laughs> Theoretically. Right. Theoretically. Well, I think the big difference is the four car garage. So that's not allowed by special permit now, is it? Yes, it is in residence A, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, so, in other words, you're going to. But maybe I'm assuming so four car garages are by this article would allow four car garages by special permit. Are they currently without this allowed by special permit? Okay. Uh, four car garages. Uh, four car garages will be allowed by special permit. Three car garages in SRA are already allowed by right. What's the current status of four car garages? Are they allowed in any district? Uh, by special permit, I would by special permit or and or variance depending on right. the district. I think there are houses. So the variance is not allowed, but by special it, it, well, it's only the special, special permit provisions. Permit. I, oh, based on what what Lee Newman said about the underlying language, I thought that. That the four car garages were new language that was inserted. May have been misunderstood. But it's saying it may issue a special permit for the four car garages. So um, they're now saying that it, it can be in, in single residence A. Right. But currently, without this language, were they allowed at all? By a special permit. We're not changing the provisions at all in single residence A. Single residence A is basically staying the same. The rules under single residence A are not changing with this amendment. Okay. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Any further with the motion in the second? Okay, hearing none, we will come to a vote. Um, Carly. Yes. yes. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> Louise. Yes. Dick. Yes. Karen. Yes. Carol? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Barry? Yes. Josh? Yes. Mm -hmm. And the chair votes yes. So we will uh, report that as a position of the Finance Committee on Article 17. 
MPT. Article 18, um, zoning accessory dwelling units. Please proceed out. So the town several years ago, as you're aware, uh, um, allowed for accessory dwelling units uh, uh, that were up to 850 square feet uh, in very limited circumstances. In every circumstance, they required a special permit from the ZBA. And they were really allowed for certain family members and caregivers. And I, uh, and that was, you know, that was the, that's the, the limitation. And over the course of, I think, three years, 12 have been uh, permitted. So there really hasn't been a very high turnover, bearing in mind that we have 8,000 uh, single family homes in our town. Um, as over the course of those three years, uh, the, the shortage of housing uh, across the region has uh, been amplified and all uh, and many municipalities are looking to try and participate in some degree of a solution to be able to create some supply that would help uh, diversify the housing stock and would add low impact housing. In a, uh, and to that end, the planning board has proposed to allow ADUs to be rented. So now you could uh, uh, you could rent an ADU. You can think of someone on a fixed income who may benefit from an additional source of income, a couple thousand dollars or twenty five hundred dollars a month uh, in additional income if they're renting out a, a one bedroom apartment in their in their house. Um, also, what was omitted before, or I should say not included, was for nannies and au pairs, and now we're allowing it for child caregivers instead of just adult caregivers. The other significant change is that we're allowing all of that inside the attached structure by right. We're also allowing, by special permit, a detached ADU. And in particular, the question with an attached ADU, if it's under five, if, it's under, if you have a garage, and the way that comes about right now is uh, accessory structures like a garage, uh, in many instances across town, may be five feet set back from the side and the rear. And could we convert those structures into uh, an ADU if someone chose to do that? So we propose to be able to, to allow uh, to do that. If, the, if that structure were to be greater than 15 feet of height, then the setback changes and it has to be the same setback as the primary structure, the primary house, the primary residence on the lot. So that would be 12 or 14 feet, depending on a, a conforming or non-conforming lot. So, so those are so those are the significant changes. I think, Leah, I've summarized those changes. Yes, you have. I can say there have been a number of towns: Lexington, Arlington, um, Newton, Wellesley, uh, that have uh, Dover is Dover is now liberal in the process of liberalizing its uh, ADU bylaw. Um, that have allowed detached structures, and it seemed to be a benefit for uh, for our seniors, for young families that are starting out, for single persons, and also um, uh, and also for local workforce housing. But a you know a, a teacher, for instance, that might be teaching in the schools may have a, be able to. Um, uh, you know, to live in town and also to think for, for any of us in the room that actually go to French press for a coffee. Jay's uh pay too much if you go there. So. I, I I don't drink I don't, I, don't, I don't drink coffee, I drink water on a cheap day at Jay's. <laughs> but I will say that um but I will say that his staff uh are 90 minutes away 
that's a three hour commute. That's a big commute. If there's an opportunity for them to live a little earlier, I mean, to, uh, to live a little closer, that certainly helps. That's just an example of how, of one of the goals that this can, uh, uh, can achieve. Well, Adam, what has been the experience with these other towns that have liberalized their ADU zoning? Have they gone from, you know, eight or 12 to X or how is it? No, so, so we're in the process of trying to compile. In fact, I've spoken to the uh, to the director of uh, of housing from the uh, MAPC, the Massachusetts Association of Massachusetts Area Planning Commission. That's the one. Thank you, Lee. Uh, they don't. They haven't conducted an audit for attached, detached ADUs, one way or the other. Um, and most municipalities don't report in. With on their liberalized basis, it's just a function of what they have, and we're in the process of compiling. Lexington, I think, was one of the earliest adopters of ADUs in the Commonwealth, and in 22 years, from 1983 to 2005, they uh, they had 60, which I think averages somewhere around three a year or so, and they've always been the most progressive of the um, uh, of the municipalities, and that's consistent with our experience before. Now that we are liberalizing it and we anticipate that there would be a greater number of these, perhaps, I will say that for the detached structure, there are three significant limiting factors that, act, that will impact the realization of these. One, it, there are a significant economic cost. The cost to conform to, uh, the cost of construction can be expensive. If uh, um, in some cases, in all cases, they'll obviously have to conform to the building code. And if Needham, Needham adopts the new uh, net zero energy code, that's gonna create even greater limitations and, uh, and will also have a, a limiting impact. Um, and the, uh, the third impact are the dimensional regulations within a particular lot. So it's, um, there are, natural limit, limiting factors on how, on the extent to which detached ADUs would be deployed or built. I have two, two initial questions. I have more to speak on this later on, but can you define to me what it, what makes up an ADU? Does it have to have plumbing? Does it have to have a, um, a stove? Does it have to have a toilet? What 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 does an ADU have to have to be considered an ADU under this uh, regulation? So an, an ADU is really defined as uh, um, uh, 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 it's a self-contained housekeeping unit. So it can, you know, which is to say it would have a, at least in, in our case, no greater than one bedroom, be a studio layout. It doesn't have to have a physical walls and so on, but up to a one bedroom, it would have uh, it would have its own plumbing, its own bathroom and shower, and it would have a kitchenette to the extent that you would include an oven. Is it, when you say it can have, is it required that they have this? It it, it 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 would have. Right now, you can do all of this, even at the five foot structure, as long as you don't have an oven. There's nothing prohibiting you from doing any of this today. The only difference is that you can actually put in an oven. That's it. All right. Then my other question, just initially, yeah. was why, why, why expand? Why going from 850 square feet to 900? What's the so over the last several years, as the state has given a lot more thought to ADUs and to encourage, uh, uh, encouraging municipalities to participate in, in this to achieve a greater public good. Uh, they've expanded in some towns in Lexington, it's a thousand square feet. Uh, and there's some guidance from the state that it's between 250 and, uh, and I think 900 square feet. So the extra 50 square feet from the 850 to the 900 would be a small, but perhaps significant benefit depending on the layout of a structure. And yet it's still, it's only, you know, five feet by 10 feet. So in itself, it's not 
that significantly. Um, question um, is there any limiting factors on number of occupants in an ADU? Yes, or? there are. Thank you for asking. And, and who's going to enforce that? How will that? Bit of... Enforcement in is a, an important question. Uh, the town would have to be notified that there was either a, a, a suspicion of a violation, and then the building commissioner would have to investigate it as they would with any other suspected violation of another code. And Lee, just to confirm, there can be no more than five unrelated uh, occupants. No, no, no. It's, it's for between the two, between the two. Yes. Oh, C. I think it's five in the total. It, it's five total, including between the, in the, the total. The, the total is five yeah. for the accessory dwelling unit and the primary house. The three for the accessory, right? Well, it's five. Oh, it's, total. A, it's basically five total. Um, occupancy the, of the ADU shall be limited to three persons. It should be limited to three persons, but the occupancy of the of the primary house and the ADU combined cannot have more than five unrelated uh, people living unrelated. there. Unrelated. So if yeah. someone has three children and grandma needs to <laughs> use the ADU, they can? No, no, they're all unrelated. Related. They're related. They're related. Yeah. It's yeah. unrelated. Oh, so it's yeah. unrelated if you're well, related. Yeah, correct. Yeah, yes, yeah you right. have a big family. <laughs> Okay, so then grandma's, okay. grandma's okay. And the grandkids are okay. okay. But if you had five <laughs> college students, I would not. Yeah. That would be it. Three college students would yeah. be okay, though. Great. Yeah. yeah. Depending. Yeah. Depending. Yeah. Depending. Yeah. Depending. Yeah. I mean, uh, do we really? Uh, okay. Te te fine. Technically, yes. Okay. You yeah. your hand up and. Uh, uh, yes, um, I think one of the, the big change here that I perceive is the lessee provision, and so that can be totally unrelated people. And I guess my question is: Are we de facto making changing this from single family zoning to, in effect, multi-family zoning? I, I appreciate the question, and I will also add, as a technical matter, in order to prohibit. What we come to see sometimes is the Airbnb effect. We were allowing that uh, these leases would be for no less than a six month term. But specifically to your question, we're allowing two dwellings in a single family lot. But as is consistent across all of the municipalities that have allowed for ADUs, as with Needham, we are we are requiring that in every way the ADU be diminutive to the and subordinate to the primary house. Yeah. So it would so it would not have the appearance. It would have the appearance of basically of a you know of some of the garages that we see in town that are yeah. you know that don't well it tends to take that away. I'm looking at three fifteen three three. The second paragraph with the building commissioner shall not deny a building permit or I can see so I'm solely due to the concern that the above reference standards are not met. So above that says it shall not diminish the character of a single thing. Then it says, but you can't deny a permit. And basically, I'm not saying it's a bad thing. No, I understand. I understand. Because I guess what I'm thinking of in terms of we go down 15 years from now and all the mansions. When the kids have moved out, there may be huge demand for people to say, hmm, I think to rent out the downstairs here to try to make ends. It, it could have a could have a significant economic interest on the McMansion phenomenon as yeah, generations move out. But let me ask I think you need to well, I don't know that you that you're necessarily interpreting that provision the way it's intended. Um we wanted to have we wanted to give the building inspector some um, ability to consult um, with the design review board in the event that he felt that it didn't comply. So we were basically saying, I mean, it's not that he can't deny it. We're saying that he 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 can only deny it if he at, after he goes through a process 
where he takes it maybe to the design review board, they give him an opinion, and then he can issue the denial um, to give him some um, input from a, a board, uh, a, 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 an objective design board that's looking at those design criteria. If, he is, if the building commissioner himself is in doubt, then he would consult yeah. with the design and the board. Exactly. Right. And yeah. that would, uh, and if their opinion, and if it's going to the design review board, they already know that that's that that is solely a visual impact, and yes. it doesn't go to the fact that there's a, another family, right? In the and that decision will, has already been made in effect that that would be permitted. Yes, overall, that's right. Yeah. And and that's separate from. I'm, the just, I'm just saying that that's a I think is a material change, of which there could be two views on them. My yes. point. I'm ambivalent on it, candidly. Barry has a strong view, though. No, 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 no my question is, uh, Adam, yeah. right now, is that what is the limitation on unrelated occupants of a single family house? I think it's, is it, it's, I think it's five. Is that it's correct? It's five. We haven't changed that. Oh. All right. So, so in theory, every house in Needham today could have five unrelated people in it living however they want to live, as long as you don't put a second oven. In the section of the house. Right. Every house could do that today by right. So to answer your question, yeah. Rick, I mean, as long as in theory, you know, people don't, you know, they can separate out the living areas as they want. As long as they don't install the second oven, they can do whatever they want exactly. by right. This is just is, is that and I'm just making sure I, you know, I, I you know understand the differences here. And you know, I guess the impact we have to think about is is it's got to increase our population materially, it's got schools and, and all that stuff. Um, yeah, with the limitation of three, it's not likely to be a lot of kids coming in for the schools. Right. And it's not intended for that effect yeah. at all. I have a question. So let's say, like to Dick's point, mm -hmm. you know, there's a McMansion owner that wants to downsize. Are you limited to just one ADU per property? Yes. Okay. So even it's a, you can't have one attached ADU and Correct. one detached ADU. Correct. You're only allowed one ADU on the lot, period. And that's and, that's and of a size. The size has to be 900. It can it can be a maximum of. And and of the ZBA cases that we've seen that have come across. We see it uh, the applications and have an opportunity on the planning board to comment to the ZBA before their process as part of their process, but before their hearing. They've ranged from I think we had one at 850. We had several at six or 650, and I think one at 750. So it 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 varies. Chairman, I know the police. I'm sorry, go ahead. So um I have a question on what exactly the goal is that you're trying to achieve, because um, I don't understand this achieving the goal of affordable rental units. And I think we have to define the word affordable. Um, and secondly, I don't understand either how the language prohibits short-term rentals um, because a lessee is defined as someone who has a lease of six or more months, but there's nothing in here that prohibits that I can see. I may not be reading the paragraphs together correctly, but that would prohibit that unit from being leased short-term serially. Um, so I can speak to, uh, I can, unless you have additional questions. No, I just was trying to understand how this was going to create affordable rental units. So, one bedrooms in this town, I happen to know it's professionally because I tend to do this on a day to day basis. I don't do a ton of rentals, but I do know the market that a one bedroom apartment in town can be up to 3,000 square feet. Mm -hmm. But in many cases, it's between 1,500 and 22, 2,400, depending on the size, the condition, and location, of course. So um, I would anticipate that given the size and location of these, it would 
you know, it would be a, a similar scenario. But what it's doing, it's creating more housing stock for people to be able to come into the town as a rental option, which is less expensive, which is to say it's more affordable than they would otherwise have the opportunity to. You can think of, for instance, uh, I, uh, I, um, you can think of it, 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 it's more affordable in a multitude of cases. A friend of mine, unfortunately, recently just got divorced. So one person stays in the house, what does the other person do if they both happen to want to continue to live in town? And there are not a lot of one bedroom apartments in town. And if you're gonna, and if you're gonna get a two bedroom or a three bedroom apartment, you're gonna be spending five thousand, six thousand dollars a month. Twenty so three hundred in the garage. <laughs> you're gonna put them in the garage. They can well, play basketball during the day. That's good. Or they could be in the attic, or they could be in the basement, or they could be in a brand new structure. Yep. So uh, you know the market choice, the market will choose itself. Um, and it's the goals are not just about affordable housing. It is also, for instance, to support our seniors that are on a fixed income that would be able to generate a, an additional source of income to help offset their their uh, cost of living, enabling them to stay in town a little longer. But I have a number. I have a number of clients that would love to be able to sell their house, but they're not. They're not selling because uh, even if they have no mortgage on their property, if they were to move into a condo, either in Needham, but more likely into Newton and Brookline in the city, it's a, it's a lateral move. There's no financial benefit to them at all because it's all, it's the same. They sell the house, they got to buy a condo and it's one, two, one, three, or one, four. Um, some cases people are selling obviously for a little more and, you know, uh, it's not a hundred percent of the, the instance, but it's it uh, that's been the real, and that's true nationally. In fact, you know, my family in Toronto deals with the same issue, and colleagues of mine in Toronto, we discussed this. That's been the, the biggest holdup in our housing market is that there's no place for people that would otherwise want to downsize, you know, uh, you know, to go that would give them an economic incentive to do that. So it helps our seniors. It, it also is another goal will will help make uh, additional housing options available to a local workforce population. And it will also, for, you know, for singles and also for, um, you know, for young families that are just starting out by uh, 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 couples, regardless of their age, actually, that may want single story living and have a, a less expensive option to be able to stay in need them should they have other family in town that they like to visit. So those are the public good, the goals that we're looking to achieve with this, uh, which all other municipalities are also trying to achieve and participate in. And then in terms of the uh, prohibition or the prevention of less than six months, uh, Lee, do you want to confirm? Yeah, yeah, Louise. Louise, I think your question is answered in the third paragraph, in the third section of the um, proposed amendment under the definition of lease, um, where it's you know, where it specifically says that the lease has to be at least six months, and that it has to prohibit subleasing, assigning the lease, um, or offering uh, accommodations on a short-term basis. It doesn't prohibit leases that are less than six months. It just defines a lessee and prohibits a lessee from right. But all but, their space. but if you I think if you look at the next page on C, yeah, the, the occupancy has to be by a lessee. So occupancy of the unit or a lessee. So in that's what so the it, occupancy needs to be. So then you go back okay. and then I, so I think you have to, it, it's in two places that you can figure that out. And, okay. and it, combining all of this with the question that Carol, you asked about enforcement, there is an affirmative obligation that you have to declare your lease to the building commissioner. So there is something on record. And we still have but, no overnight parking, right? In Needham. So yeah. I'm glad you asked that. So that's true. That's correct. And we're requiring that all parking be on site. To be able to accommodate uh, any in front of the garage. With that, hi, it's Carly on on the Zoom. So, so two points there that can can the language be called out more succinctly that 
you're trying to what uh, John and Louise are piecing together there. Can we just be clearer rather than piecing together and inferring uh, between that that six month part? My second question is not, maybe not appropriate or not able to be answered here is what's the impact to the town overall with if we're talking about you know overnight parking changing overnight parking um what's what's not, the impact to the population yeah i think just to follow up on that i think the financial impact what are the positive financial impacts that can come to the town through this i'd like to hear what that is yes secondly what the consideration of the financial downsides to the town and I consider them what let's talk about it is potential impacts on schools, sure. potential impact mm -hmm. on, on town services, yeah. um, water, sewer, roadway, um, roadways, and then um, enforcement and uh, further burdening our our building commissioner and needing to most likely enforce, provide he or she with additional sources to address something they didn't have to address before when they already have more than enough on their plate. So what, why don't you break down to us what the financial benefits are and then what the financial negativities are. Thanks, John. So, That's what I was trying to get to. <laughs> uh, you, you did. You did. So thank you. Uh, if, I, if I may answer a question about the overnight parking. No, I want you to answer my question. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't intend to obviously so from that. Let's but I, I'm happy to address it, but I just, there seems to be some, I miss it. piece of misinformation I'd like to correct. But specifically on the on the question of financial impact, uh, if any time a homeowner expands the square footage of their house, it increases the value of their house. So if a home was two thousand square feet, and now you add nine hundred square feet, it's not that would only be for an accessory outside of the house. It wouldn't be the house is already built. No, you would you would you could bump out. In, in in several instances of the ADUs that we've approved, it's been it's been a bump out of 900 square. Feet. Yeah, so you're reclaiming the 900 square feet. Um, so that would have an additive impact on the pure economic value of the house, but the way the town assesses that, it takes a bit of time for that to um, uh, be realized. I think in the assessment process. But overall, it would have, in that sense, an uplifted impact because it raises the value of the property. Um, we have not quantified the financial impact of the costs associated with the town, which would include, uh, you know, which could include public safety, uh, in addition to enforcement, uh, in addition to uh, schools. You've listed all of the, uh, you know, um, the likely areas of potential impact, and I can't give you, I, I can't quantify for you how many we're going to expect. We don't have a goal that we're going to suddenly create ten more one-bedroom apartments in the town, and we know that this is what the effect is going to be, and run an algorithm to all of those. We we haven't established. A goal we want to make it available to the town. We want to make it available to residents and homeowners as a benefit to them. And we've had three, so if we could double, then we had six. There are so many limiting factors that would realize, especially the detached unit, but regardless of whether it's attached or attached, that we would have, uh, you know, a significant impact in our school system or into public safety, or into our roadway network, and you know, and more cars on uh, on the roads that would um, uh, it would be a traffic you know an additional a significant uh, traffic burden. So, unfortunately, I can't give you the precision that I suspect you're really looking for. Yeah, I mean, I'm not, I know the precision is impossible, but I was looking for a little bit more than just we can't quantify it. I, and, I, and I wonder, if I may, just a, has there been any thinking to say, well, instead of making it universal, why not say that there can be no more than 20 ADUs in the town and we'll see if we get to that. And if there's a need for more, we can do it on an incremental basis, perhaps rather than just saying, 
we're opening the doors and it's, it can be a free for all. It, it, it seems if we can't quantify the negativities, why open ourselves up to unlimited negativities as opposed to limiting in the first instance to, to actually see this through to make sure we're not putting ourselves into a real negative place financially. I understand, multiply by the number of units that we get, you know, on an, uh, every year, of course. Um, that that hasn't been considered. We haven't. We haven't. Well, I, I, I think it hasn't. Been, I think it hasn't been considered because the historical the the historical um, situation across the Commonwealth, when you look at other communities' experience, is that there is not there are not a great deal of these ADUs created, and there aren't these huge bubbles that are being created in towns like Newton or Lexington. That just hasn't been the experience, and so. Um, that's, I think, probably why you're not seeing those kinds of ceilings. I've been, I've been asking specifically the questions that you know that you just impose, or that you've just that you've just raised, and and uh, you know to the MAPC and to a number of municipalities, and they haven't really been able to break out, and so, and and we and except to say that it's been such a low volume, it hasn't had a discernible impact. On any of the town services, public safety, schools, public works, water, um, uh, water and sewer, uh, and other parts of the town infrastructure. At this point, but is it still appropriate to set an upper bound in at any rate, just to, you know, uh, finger in the wind? You set an upper bound, so you, we don't have to revisit that when we. Because you don't, you're saying you don't know. If we set an upper bound, at least that you have some ceiling to deal with, and if we have to revisit again, we would. But having it fully open doesn't um, doesn't seem um, correct. I I understand that impulse. And um, Mr. Chairman, I, I did have a couple of questions. I'm sorry. I, let me. I, I I know I have you. I have Josh, and I have Dick. Yeah. Um, but we're gonna so. Let me just, do you have any more answering Carly's question on that? I'm not, so I, I, my last two comments on that are one, I'm not sure that we can actually, uh, that we can discriminate by the certain number. There may be a question of discrimination uh, on the one hand and on the other hand, in every instance, that in every municipality, it's been such a negligible impact. There hasn't been a, you know, there hasn't been a need to in comparison to the public good that it provides and the options that it provides to the homeowner. Josh, you had your hand up then, Jim. You're gonna be next, okay. Cool. Uh, so for communities like, like Newton or Lexington that have done this um, and they had, it's the same structure where they need to provide a lease to the building commissioner to show that it's of a certain duration. Would at least that data be able to show what proportion of the small number of ADUs are rented out versus not rented out? We'll continue to ask the question. Um, and then the other thing you mentioned to me that I hadn't thought of before, um, when you were talking about you know, buying a condo in Boston, when you have a property and when you have a property that has a, a, a main house and, a, and a, um, an ADU, is there a potential that that could be condoized that you could? Separate them out for ownership purposes. No, no, we're not. It's not all permissible. We're because we're not because that would be specifically would be creating, uh, you know, district. No. Yeah, that would be a. Uh, it's not a. It's not a, a permissible thing. And just a follow up to Josh's point, though, in these other towns, is it permissible? Like. I feel like the ADU thing, and, and Paul Alfred said it three years ago when we had a long debate about what is this ADU, you know, and his point was that they he wanted to, the planning board, I think the phrase was walk before they can run. So is this kind of run before we can race, you know, so. What else is coming down the pike? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So. On it, it's it's impossible to know. Um, walk walk before we run. I, I think that's borne out to be true. What's the race look like? 
I think that we've seen some municipalities that have gone to a thousand square feet and then have also allowed some to be two. But I can't sit here today and tell you declaratively that in two years or 20 years, that a number of residents will ask that we make those additional modifications. And to Josh's point, to be able to then split the lots and split the ownership and to, uh, and to conduise these and so on. I, um, there are legal um, questions that, that are at play that impact that. And I just can't, I don't have the expertise to be able, or the crystal ball to be able to answer in any significant way and give you the satisfaction that we'd like for the answer. Jim? The, um, you may have answered this already, just wanted to clarify. The lessor does not have to be owner occupied or does? The, 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 oh, the homeowner has to occupy as their primary residence at all times, one of the two units. So the owner could actually live in the ADU, ADU and rent, rent out, out their the home. entire house. The same way that you can mm -hmm. rent out your house now, that's true, except that if you're going to have an ADU, um, uh, then you have to live in the ADU if you want to rent out your house. So arguably, you could end up, from a cost perspective, if you get to the point where your children are gone, so you move yeah. into the ADU and you rent out to a family with four, five, six kids. They're going to the schools. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. And has that been factored into your thinking? No. And the reason is because the reason is because I don't need the reason. Second question mm -hmm. is the 900 square feet, can that be part of the existing home? So, in other words, can, can someone actually capitalize on some portion of the existing property plus the 900? So you're only building 900. You're only, that's all you're building. That's the, that's the new square footage. But you use some of the existing square footage for the leasehold estate. So there are dimensional, there are all kinds of dimensional regulations in our zoning bylaw that have a limiting impact what you're speaking of. And if you're gonna, if you're gonna create a rentable unit, you would create it in, in, in one unit. It's not like you would have a bedroom uh, built out uh, uh, behind, let's say a garage and then do a, and then it finish the basement or a bathroom and a kitchen. If I understood your question correctly, you would, um, you know, you would either, uh, you would either build, um, and there are a number of options that, that you could. What I'm trying to get at is, is, is the, is the leasehold estate that you're creating, is it a maximum of 900, or is the renovation a maximum of 900, but to which you could add to that. A portion of the existing home. You get my point? If I understand your point, the maximum the maximum size of the leasehold of the rentable of the new rentable unit would be that would be nine hundred square feet. Okay, great, thank you. But you could also rent out the main house. No, I got that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got that, and then I and he answered that, and I, that does cause uh, concerns for me. But what I was also concerned about is. Okay, so I do the 900 bump out, but I'm not using the west wing of this house anymore. So I now put the bump out right next to the west wing. And now I have a door that just goes right no, no, into the west not. wing. That's prohibitive. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm just struggling with the financial impact. And it seems to me the restraint for family and caregiver is a practical constraint on how big this could be. So the leasehold potential is the wild card. And to what extent is there experience in the other community with leasehold versus caregiver and family? So it's uh, it's allowed in a number of municipalities and we don't have statistics that say either on a proportional basis, the total number of ADUs are created, how many have been rented, nor 
And they should just, the municipalities have not been breaking that down. They haven't been compiling the data. I guess, speaking totally personally, I'm uncomfortable yes. going ahead with this without any basis for drawing conclusions as to the impact of the lease provision. I, and there's certainly no support given in the, the right in the, your presentation to get the date yeah. um, or in the town meeting or in the warrant article expl explanation. The reason for that. that, the reason for that is because when I've spoken to the town planner at Lexington and Concord and Wellesley and the select board members in Wellesley and Lee and Alex have spoken to three or four other municipalities looking to be able, anticipating almost all of these questions tonight. The answer is there's so few in number, it hasn't had an impact on our schools even when you rent out the primary house. You know, I actually guess if there's so few a number, then there's not a big demand. I would suggest we table the lease provision until there's more experience and see if is there demand, what's likely to happen. But we're not we're not frustrating a market if it if it, nothing's happening, I would suggest why we're at a risk. I understand that. Josh. Everyone understands it's much a bit better. So are you are you saying that there's, you think there's more of a negative financial impact for some releases? Yeah, I perceive that I because agree. I think it's more I like agree. more likely to have school children move in in a lease environment than family. It's just a natural constraint in family as to how many would qualify as family. And caregivers not likely to have a lot of children attached to it. But if it's totally unrelated, people can come in as lessees. Seems right. to me there's more potential for young children coming well, in. We sat on the, you know, when we sat and met with the schools over all the years yeah. that we've sat with them and, and, and gone through their budget and gone through their their um, uh, needs, whether it's special education or otherwise. It, it was always uh, said to us in those meetings that people moved to Needham and found, found opportunities to come to Needham because of those programs that we were offering. Um, in, in the schools, and to me, the, to me, there I think there's a real potential impact here on that. Um, and by up to three people um, allowing them to all of a sudden now live in, in these um, ADUs that never existed before, so I, I think there's a real potential for that to occur. And hence, I go back to what I said before: is why why make it so unlimited to begin with? Why don't we temper ourselves or walk ourselves through it to make sure we're not putting ourselves in a potentially adverse financial situation. That's what my my big concern on this is. That's a good question. Yeah. Does the town have uh, either through your office or through the uh, the superintendent's office and an, an economic understanding of of all the students that are enrolled in our schools, how many of those are living in homes that are rented in town versus owned? We don't have that, um, and whether they do or not, we could certainly find out. But I, I'm not. I, I know we don't have that information. Because yeah. I think that's, a, you know, that would be a telling question, uh, on a proportion and then applied on a proportional basis for how many ADUs are typically created, and then we'd understand the significance of that to the school. Just oh, it may be, as if I'm reading this correctly, that. The ADU is limited to no more than one bedroom. Yes. That may be a practical constraint on having many kids because the theory is the demographer will tell us that if you have one bedroom apartments, you, there are very few kids associated with that. So there, there may be that practical constraint. That's right. But isn't the real issue, the real way that you would generate many school children is for what you the were flip. saying? Or right, the yeah. whole the homeowner moves into the ADU. Live in the ADU. But there are two limiting factors with that. One is, um, one is you can already rent out your house. You can rent out your house, and you can right. and you can right. live with another. Live somewhere else. Right. Yeah. So that's not limiting. That's different. Well, yeah. it has the same net impact though in terms of bringing. But when you say you also your rent your house, right, so I you're, got it. You're, you're creating, presumably, your like 
small leaseful causes someone to leave the community potentially or to go to a condo or something like that and i i think that is a prohibiting factor i mean that's that mm -hmm. could be a deal changer the other impact the other limiting factor is uh it if you're going to have if you're living in your house and you're going to and then you build this adu right which is everything that you would want to when you downsize and now you have now you're renting out your 3500 square foot house that's 15 feet away you know you're going to be sharing your yard with their kids your grandkids are going to come over and they're there are so many natural well, limiting Well, unless elements. it's your grandkids. Like, why would In which case, it? right. So then, yeah, that's right. You uh, And in some cases that, you know, that that may happen, that you would, that the, that the, um, that the homeowner is, which is, uh, and that's part of, that's part of what we've actually been able to do already with the existing ADU structure, that you could, by the definition of, of family, already do that mm -hmm. you could have, have this adu that the that the um uh that the that the parents mm -hmm. move into and then they and then they have the kids move into the main house then you're a little less concerned about it because of your kids and your grandkids but if you're doing it to people that you don't know i think that you know that's a lot to ask to have that many strangers you know, up all over your space, uh, you know, coming and going with all of the parties and all of the things that kids do. Uh, it's, I'm not sure a lot of people are going to be so thrilled to be able to do that. Any further questions or discussions? And I, you know, I know the one we've had, we've had in the past about on things like this is whether or not there's a finan discernible financial impact. I, to me, I think that question is answered. There is, yep. um, so and the so I think at least, yeah, there's yeah, certainly the potential, potential sure. for it. So I don't think that this is an appropriate one for us to, like we did on the prior one with the three car garage, take a position. Um, and uh, so I do think we we need to. And and my concern is the way the question was answered, and not it's not your fault, nope. um, but I with respect that. to how it's answered, and and to me, there's much more potential for a negative economic in, impact by the passage of this than there is a positive economic impact. So for that reason, I'm gonna be voting not to recommend it as mm -hmm. a finance committee member, um, because I, I just think the potential is much greater on the downside than on the upside. Now I leave it alone on a public policy and I'm not looking at it from that. Um, it's just from a financial impact, which I need to do sitting in this seat. I, uh, I have to take accept accountability and responsibility for that. You're absolutely right. I recognize the potential. That's true. But uh, that's just would people want to comment or, or yeah, let me just, just, just quibble. Quibble. And, and if, if, if in the course of discussion the motion is made to amend this and remove the lease provision, would you still feel the same way, or would you? I think as a finance committee, I could vote in favor of it without the lease provision because I see less exposure. It's the, I mean, yeah, yeah. it's the least provision that gives me concern that 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 could have the financial impact that could be adverse. Right, but right now, yeah, so that's what I'm, but I'm just, just there, but trying to anticipate yeah. if there was such a dynamic. I, of, I think of, I would, I would I mean, personally will look at it. Yeah. perhaps look at it there. Josh, well, I think the positive financial impact is in home values. I would imagine that maybe you could increase the value of homes. I, I guess yeah. I don't have that data, but I would imagine yeah. that. And I think, too, just as sort of an arms race thing, if other towns are doing this, then, as they say, an arms race thing, we better keep pace with what's going on in the comparable communities, or it will have an adverse financial impact on the town. And then in terms of negative financial impacts, I think when we're talking about schools, it's when both the main unit and the able unit have school children in them. Because I think if you have schools in one and not the other, Mm -hmm. That's net zero. Like there's there's no change from the status quo. Anyone else have any comments? Does anyone want to make a motion with respect to this um, article? That, yeah, uh, 18? Chair, I recommend that the finance committee uh, take a position 
not to recommend adoption of article whatever this is 17 18 18, 18. 18. 18. 18. article 18. There's a second for a second motion. second by Karen any discussion yeah. I'll, I'll, I, I, all I would say is I don't disagree that the impact there's a lot of constraining factors that will limit mass adoption of this you know that would have a significant financial impact I do think you know the primary I do I do I I do feel bad that the primary purpose of this is to accommodate people who otherwise would be you know, are forced out of this town or have some connection to the town that can live here. Mm -hmm. Having said that, I think without having some some type of tangible analysis that we can and and it, I, I think it's you know we're gonna spend two hours at town meeting because there is no tangible evidence that to make the argument hugely favor for or against. And that's the unfortunate thing about this, because I know the, the intent, I, I appreciate the intent and, and it is, and I don't think, you know, sort of ripping the Band-Aid off, which is sort of the implicit, uh, what we're implicitly doing here is, is going to open the floodgates necessarily. However, there probably are intermediate steps that could be taken to observe this for a few more years in a much looser structure to see what the reality ends up being. And unfortunately, you know, without evidence to the, any evidence other than the anecdotal evidence that you, we're just gonna, unfortunately, it, there's, it's hard to knowing the intent to just say yes for that reason. Um, I think you know this could have been done in a you know in, in a and I know how hard it is to do these so I mean, I, and I'm not I'm not trying to criticize anybody in particular but it's just you know I think we're gonna have a very frustrating debate come tell me because of that. Eric, can I ask a question? Would all of you feel similarly whether? You could rent it as an attached or a detached. If the thing was if the thing was only attached and you could still rent it out, would you all continue to feel exactly the same way? Well, I don't know if it, it, it's you all, but I can just answer or, for myself. It is the least least part, whether it's separate or, or within it, it's the least part of it. Okay. It, it's for me. Okay. That's helpful. Thank you. I mean, I do know people are doing this now under the table. Yes. And it is happening, whether you know it's obviously not being regulated. Um, but you know, we're at a tipping point with the schools too. And that's probably um I appreciate the intent here. I'm probably much more sensitive though, because I'm you know how intimately we know the school situation in the in in the demography. And listen, it's only because we have a great town. If we don't you look at all the towns around us. You, know, you, you probably know better than than we do what's going on in school age population in neighboring towns, and they're they're all having different experiences than we are. And that's a benefit to everything else that you know we have here in town. But um, so so for that reason, I'm much more sensitive and want would want more concrete information. If it is at all attainable. So I. I just like to say that I um, do appreciate the intent, and you know we're going to be, you know, facing this in in many instances when we are forced to, I don't know, look at you know an NBA MBTA communities, you know, significant mm -hmm. development, mm -hmm. and I think that's going to be a lot harder than looking at the yeah. MBUs. But I do agree that we do not have any, you know, data that would indicate this sure. is going to open the floodgates or no one cares. So I guess kind of getting back to John's point in the beginning, if there was some limiting factor that we could observe, let's say we're going to allow, I don't, I'm making up a number, 20, you know, 
20 and then we'll reassess. I think it might be for me more palatable. So so I, I agree with what everyone has said, in particular Carly and uh, Dick and and John. I, I don't I, I think this is creating multifamily dwelling zoning. That's what I think it's doing. And and I'm not sure that's appropriate. And I'm not sure it's fair, frankly, for the rest of the neighbors who live within that that neighborhood. Anything else? Um, if not, then I'm going to call for a vote on Dick's motion that was seconded by Karen, and I'll switch around a little bit. Uh, Carol? The uh, motion, the motion, yeah, Ryan, the motion is uh, not to recommend. Not to recommend. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Karen? Yes. Josh? No. And uh, Carly? Yes. Louise? Yes. Dick? Yes. Karen? Yes. And the chair votes yes. So that will be um, eight yeses on the motion and one negative. So the recommendation of the town meeting will be not to recommend the doctrine of Article 18. Okay, next is Article 19. Zoning, collective zoning amendments. So this is a uh, um, a number of changes uh, in our zoning uh, bylaw. For instance, one, we have a building commissioner now, not a, a building inspector. So we're changing the zoning bylaw. I don't anticipate, by the way, any of these will have financial impact. <laughs> Uh, we're renumbering in the zoning bylaw. There was a boo boo in the print job before. Uh, there are two 3.15 sections in the zoning bylaw, so one of them has to change. The required parking, the zoning bylaw hasn't been reprinted to update the Institute of Traffic Engineers uh, manual uh, for parking since the second edition. So we're adding uh, the words. Uh, the most the most recent edition of so those are the the substan those are the changes of these and this is the chairman is the vote in in number two does that have anything to do with what we just discussed no in other words if no action were to did you just get elected chair I apologize <laughs> through me I'm we're asking that question I'm yeah, you're right yeah. you're right no no, no go ahead yeah. no go ahead I'm, it, it I'm sorry I'm just joking I, I understand it, but you're also right. I was, I was <laughs> on the line. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh. Um, I apologize. The, the if no action were to be taken, if we were not going to renew the, uh, if we're not pro uh, proposing a zoning bylaw change to uh, this, we'd still have to do this. It would have no impact. Mr. Chair, I make a motion that uh, finance committee take no position with respect to 19 because there is no discernible financial impact. Second. Second. Right, Carl? Um, we'll go around the other way this time. Uh, Karen? Uh, yes. The, the motion is that there's no financial mm -hmm. impact. Right. Yeah. Okay. Dick? <laughs> yes. Carly? Yes. Josh? Yes. Karen? Yeah. Louise? Yes. <laughs> yeah. The roundabout? <laughs> yes. Karen? Carol. Yes. <laughs> I started my day at 5 30 this morning. Yeah, really? yeah. And uh, the chair was, yes. Keep uh, it simple. Keep it simple. Yeah. I'm trying to switch things up. Okay, so that is the no position on, on Article 19. Um, you're almost there, Adam. Article yes. 20. Article 20, I don't anticipate having any financial impact at all, the town, positively or negatively. All this is about. Is um, is taking 32 feet of a sidewall and requiring that if you know should the build the structure continue, it has to come in two feet and then continue. What has been happening in the building community when as this act was ultimately uh, instituted in our bylaw as a result of the um, large house review committee to break up the massing and the and the uh, or the design of a building. So instead of this scenario, which is the intent, which is what this bylaw will change, builders were getting cute and we're just building the whole thing 
without having to do that little jog to you know set back to um, two feet further, and yet it was still creating the whole the same problem just two feet uh, further from the lot line. So this language uh, purifies the intent. That's very interesting. That's very interesting. So what was supposed to happen is if you're building on this and you're looking at this side of a house, if your house were to be 32 feet, it's 32 feet. But if you wanted your house to be 40 feet in length, which is not uncommon, you were supposed to come in two feet and then you would continue for the other eight feet. That was supposed to be the plan. So that's to avoid a scenario where you just have one long massing. Just because it looks ugly? Okay. To break it, yes, to break up the massing and it can, it can have some visual impact to a neighbor. So what was happening is instead of going through the expense of this design change and the material change and the labor and so on, Builders were just saying, okay, well, we'll just forget the jog and do the whole thing, 40 feet, all in one. So you, there would be no jog, it was just a big massing, but the whole thing was set back now two more feet, two more feet. Oh, I see. And so this now perfects that condition. So it makes it a little more clear than it had been before. Drafters error. Perhaps. Seems fascinating to me that that would be less expensive to do it than. Well, it's just one straight line. Yeah. It's just it's, yeah, but you're also but you're losing the two feet of it for the thirty-two feet. Right. So you're actually you have less square footage. Um, Five thousand square foot and ten thousand square foot lot. So regardless of how you shape it, it's still incredible that it goes that. Does uh, anyone see any financial impact on that one? No. 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 Uh, can I have a motion to that effect now? A move. Second. So Jim's motion, second moved by Louise, is for the finance committee to take no position on Article 20 due to a lack of um, discernible financial impact. Um, so we'll take a vote on that. Carol. Yes. 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 Josh. Yes. Carly. Yes. Lisa. Yes. Dick. Yes. Karen. Yes. Chair votes yes. So um, that will be the uh, no position will be what will be in the line for that. Um, anything further for Adam or for um, Lee? Thank you, Lee. Thank you, Adam. Thank Appreciate you it very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. For the record, we have an alum in the audience. Yes. <laughs> Want to come up and sit with us? Yeah. No. Good to see you. <laughs> Good to be here. I was upstairs. Are you lost? What? My <laughs> boss. I was upstairs doing a very oh. strange um, opening um, presentation. And we had done, that came down. Yeah, you know, the sausage was being made. But they didn't bring any pizza. No pizza? <laughs> no. no pizza? I just, you know, I had one pizza because your husband finished it all wrong. Oh. <laughs> 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 right. 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 Take care. Take your hand. All Thank right. You. So let's go yeah. to. Uh, in into the town meeting warrant article on um, article 10 town owned land surveys we had a discussion at this at uh, our previous meeting we asked for some information that was provided um in a memo that was then amended after uh, Dick um, raised a point on it um is there any further either questions or discussions people would like to have on article 10. Well, to, to me, this, this seems like a nice to have. I mean, we you know, have all these land surveys, these lands that don't have surveys, but they also don't have any immediate pressing needs and immediate pressing projects for the surveys required. So I would say if anything could be deferred, this is something that's probably good. Um, I, the thing I would like to see and what was helpful is get an idea that this isn't going to go on yeah. forever. And I think the memo did a great job. So thank you for that um, Tom on that. And it was helpful. Um, so um, it, it, you know, I think if this was going on forever, I would look at it a little bit differently than, than what it is right now. It seems like we're, we're, identical, we're 
And what we've done, we've identified what we're going to do, and we sort of have an end in sight, it appears, correct? Yeah. yeah. We have uh, listed the, 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 the top uh, 15 or so. Oh, my glass is on, but yeah. Yeah, okay. The, uh, just one question on the memo. There was a number at the end of the memo of the, uh, 350,000. Yes. Was it, does that include this appropriation or was that incremental to this appropriation? Uh, that was a total amount for all for all the uh, properties. Reserved. So that in, would include the roughly 100,000 for this? Yes. Okay. You don't have a motion? Mr. Chair, I recommend that the Finance Committee recommend adoption of Townland Survey article, whatever article that is. Article 10. 10. Is there a second for Dick's motion? Second. Second by Barry. Any discussion, question, or comment? Hearing none, coming to the vote. Um, Karen? Yes. Dick? Yes. Louise? No. Carly? Yes. Josh? No. Aaron? Yes. Yeah. No. Carol? Yes. And chair votes yes. Um, I think that's the correct thing. On 6 3 vote, the um, Finance Committee will recommend adoption of Article 10. Mm -hmm. Next is Article 11. Please re 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 refresh. <laughs> So, um, Mr. Chair, I met with the DPW and with um, the finance director, and we discussed fleet refurbishment at great length. Um, so, with respect to this particular article, there are specific pieces of equipment, specific vehicles that need to be refurbished right now that this money will be used for um, out of the general fund and the sewer enterprise or the sewer enterprise um, vehicle. We did discuss reviewing the life cycle again of vehicles and trying to replace vehicles as needed and to the extent that these really might belong in the operating budget because it appears that it is becoming a recurring expense so that we extend the life cycle of the vehicles. Um, we will be hearing a little bit more next year about what might be needed um, to do that. So, any, uh, any questions or comments? Questions on this article? Mr. Chair, I move that the Finance Committee recommend adoption of Article 11 appropriate for fleet refurbishment. Second. Second by John. Okay, we'll come to a vote then. Uh, Barry? Yes. Yeah? Yes. Carol? Yes. Aaron? Yes. Dick? Yes. Louise? Yes. Carly? Yes. And the chair votes yes, so that's unanimous. I vote yes. Mr. Yeah. Josh, <laughs> get the point of view. So uh, that's a nine to zero vote uh, to recommend adoption of Article 11. Um, now we turn to Article 25, General Fund Cash Capital, with a focus being on the fleet program. So, you have um, things on that, Luis? I do. So, on that one, um, again, we reviewed each of the um, vehicles that is in the fleet replacement cycle with the exception of the fire vehicles. Um, I only focused on the um, DPW vehicles with DPW. Um, so the um, replacement cycle for vehicles is continuing to be hopefully 10 years. There were some issues with some of the Ford vehicles the, that were purchased for the building inspector. We did talk about replacement cycle all in one year, uh, but I don't think it can be avoided because the vehicles are really junk, basically. <laughs> so um, they're gonna be replaced with SUV hybrids. Um, the cost estimates you felt were comfortable, you were comfortable with, um, but as we know, you know, there are, there are um, a lot of fluctuations in the market right now, so. Um, and then with respect to reviewing um, other vehicles, and we talked about what they were being replaced with and why. Um, and with each vehicle replacement, the DPW is sitting down and reviewing um, with the finance director any changes to vehicles so that they are more um, effective in terms of what DPW uses them for. 
Um, so, I mean, we had a good discussion. It was detailed. I, I was satisfied. I would recommend that um, we fund the items that are requested for DPW within the um, general fund cash cap. That would be all, in, but for the fire live truck, which we're going to talk about separately. Yeah, we did talk about the school as well. So this would include the school. And we talked about future plans with vans and buses. And around what percentage, I know you have years um, for what years these went into service, but is there sort of a percentage of what, what we're turning over every year as far as it high percent of the fleet, 10 percent of the fleet, 20 percent? Is there so it's is, less than 10 percent? It? It's less than 10 percent because we try to get longer um, life cycle out of the larger vehicles and then it, you're trying to get 10 out of the smaller ones right so it's less than 10 percent i think it's a sustainable replacement cycle in terms of what we can afford right now yes. uh, just a question which i should have asked years ago um the five of these are for the building inspector and which doesn't strike me there's probably a lot of materials that the building inspector is carrying have we looked at is it the trade off between having them reimburse them for personal use of their vehicle versus town acquiring vehicle? I think Dave's <laughs> <laughs> hand went up. Okay. The, um, it's uh, because of the sites they have to go to and they do incur damage to some of the construction sites. The employees are do not want to use their personal vehicles. The other factor is um, most job sites are actually secured that you just can't enter the property and there's rules and regulations that require developers uh, uh, developers from allowing people on the property a marked vehicle so that they're clear that it's a public official entry property. Okay. So there are two reasons for that. But the primary is the employees don't want to damage their vehicle going to the construction site. I have a third, um, which sure. is the uh, their enforcement agents, and I think sometimes they get into conflicts with individuals, and I think they'd rather not have their personal vehicle be identified um, with that. So I think there's also that side of it as well. I uh, couldn't agree with you more. There's also an insurance issue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It could be yeah. most personal. Question, appropriate policy. question to ask. And <laughs> business use, and so if this became a business use. And the vehicle was then involved in an accident, and the primary insurance carrier could actually withdraw coverage. Um, and frankly, if there was an accident on the way, all of a sudden this person's vehicle is now out of use in the body mm -hmm. shop. If we're going to run a program and they're going to need to use vehicles, we should be supplying the vehicles. I hate to say it, but yeah. I do have a question, though, Mr. Chair. So, the, of the of the um, five million nine hundred thirty-six thousand six hundred and seven dollars, that's all coming from free cash. Can I ask Dave that question? You can. And so, what does that tell us about our free cash balances? I know you're going to give us that to us at some point, but the estimate on free cash is fifteen million for this year, and uh, with, with all available for this year, available for this year and for appropriations. Uh, and um, if all the appropriations are uh, requested in the annual town meeting and special town meeting are approved, we would be uh, about $800,000 left for all of the following year. So the recommendation is going to be almost to use all of it? Uh, yes, uh, everything is funded. We would use almost all of it. And I'm, this is not within the four corners, but if I can have a little leeway, is any of that going to operating or, or is it all? One time expense. Um, uh, over three million is for the operating budget, which has already been approved. For the finance and that's committee. within our guidelines, right? And that's within the guidelines. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Anything else? Mr. Chairman, uh, just one additional uh, piece of information, which uh, Louise had asked, and I, I finally got the number. Uh, included in the cash capital. Uh, is the uh, two pieces of the fire equipment, the ambulance that is the uh, that is to be purchased. The ambulance that will be disposed of is uh, rescue identified as rescue three, which is the 2016 ambulance. Uh, that was a question. Tom mm -hmm. has five vehicles, four frontline and one 
uh, reserved for training. And they bump down uh, every time we purchase a new ambulance. The second thing is on the C, uh, CO1. Is that the Tahoe? The Tahoe, yes. That's the, uh, on the Tahoe CO1, uh, that vehicle will be the new vehicle for the chief. The chief's vehicle bumps down to uh, the uh, one of the deputy chiefs, and it and there's a domino effect. The vehicle that the town will be disposing of uh, upon this purchase will be a 2013 Ford Explorer. Thank you for that. Yeah. And what, what was the ambulance? The, the one that's actually being disposed of is? It will be the 2016 uh, Ford ambulance. It's the vehicle that's in the poorest condition of the five. Yeah. Any further questions? I'm sorry, I'm not, not following things as well as I used to. Why is the Quint ladder mentioned in this? Uh, that's uh, another. Um, Error that's going to be in there. The three things that you see in there the two trailers that read OB mm -hmm. and the uh, ladder truck, they're going to be removed <laughs> in the version that's going to be published and distributed to town meeting members. Okay, so I'm not losing my mind. Uh, maybe. A good question on that follow up. Does that mean then that the $5 million number is $2 million less? No, uh, that number is correct. It just, this was the table. Uh, in my capital submission, that's uh, where the cost of the table and they put it in here and they, and they, were, they forgot to strike those three items when I uh, recommended that we fund the Fine. ladder truck as a standalone item. Are you looking for a vote, Mr. Chair? Do I we still have presentation. We're, I'm asking if there's any further, but I don't think so. So I'm um, be happy to get a motion. So all the all the other one people have already come in and done whatever they yeah. can to make a motion that we recommend adoption of Article 25. Second. Any questions or comments? Very right now we'll come to vote. Carol. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Gary. Yes. Doc. Yes. Harley. Yes. Please? Yes. Okay. Yes. Karen? Yes. And the chair votes yes. So that's unanimous. Support of Article 25. We'll go to Article 26, um, which is the fire ladder truck. Mm -hmm. so we discussed this during the presentation uh, of the operating budget. We actually went through all of the capital. I don't think people or anyone is going to come back. Right. I think so either. Um, I, I just had one question. Yeah. Is this what happens to the existing um, is this is there any salvage in that? What are what are we uh, what happens to the we um we are gonna uh do two things. One, we're gonna see what we could get for value as in a trading, which generally the companies will not block it until the day that they submit their bid. Uh and if that isn't uh favorable to us, then we'll try auctioning it off. Uh, we've been been quite successful in getting better value in the auctioning. And when I mean better value, better value for the taxpayers that we get more money back than we were getting off on that trade-in. So whether we do it through a trade-in or through an auction, whatever we get, that's not vehicles not being kept. So it's it's not being sort of credited or netted out. Whatever that is, that will come as Funds to the town that will go into the revenue stream. It which funds are now not reflected yeah. in Article 26. And, and I will repeat what the chief said. You know, this $2 million figure is already, I think it's about four or five months old at mm -hmm. this point. The equipment, I think, if I'm not if I'm remembering correctly, could take two years to get. So the importance is to try and, and lock this in now if we can because the prices are going nowhere but up. And I believe they said there's only either three or four manufacturers of these types of heavy equipment in the United States. So- And they're all custom made, aren't they? Yes. In effect, I mean, there's some yeah. basic parts, but- Okay, um, so is there a- A motion to recommend adoption of Article 26. A second. motion is seconded by Dick, okay. Um, We'll go around the room and have a vote on it. Um, Carol? Yes. Jim? Yes. 
Eric? Yes. Josh? Yes. And Carly? Yes. He's stepped out, Dick? Yes. Eric? Yes. And Chair votes yes. So. But I don't know if Louise intended to do this, but in case she did, because it's a firearm. Yeah, yeah. 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 that's it. She refused to sound. Yeah. Her being refused, it's an eight to no vote. All right. Any more okay. fire stuff? Nope. Come back, Louise. <laughs> Okay, so we're at your Yeah, and Mr. Chair, just to be clear, uh, we really did find that she did not involve herself in the discussion of the fire capital in the fleet as well. Yeah, Article 30 um, is the cash capital items that are covered within the Sewer Enterprise Fund. Any questions or information? Questions people have or information they desire uh, on this. Uh, Just out of curiosity, what is what will the net retained earnings be after this? This is coming out of retained earnings. Um, retained earnings would be a few hundred thousand dollars remaining. Silver is always closed. Very close. Any questions on this? Other than finally, Cook's Bridge is getting done. Where's Cook's Bridge? Over by the St. Mary. Mills Falls. Over. Okay. Um, does someone want to make a motion then? Motion to recommend adoption of Article 30. Second. Second by Dick. Okay, we'll go for a vote on that. Uh, Carol. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Barry. Yes. Josh. Yes. Carol. Yes. Please. Yes. Dick. Yes. Karen. Yes. Chair votes yes as well, so that's the um, Article 31, water enterprise capital. Um, again, from retained earnings, the amount of 771, 133, the three categories that are listed there. Um, if people have any questions about or need information yeah, Is that, that a typo in that the total is 633? Yep. No, it shouldn't be. It's uh, five nine five five hundred plus one forty two one thirty. So the, the six or something. But it's the top. The top. It's the seven seventy one one thirty three. Six thirty three. Six thirty three. This number here and that. Oh. There's a one and a six. I don't know what we're going to do without you. <laughs> <laughs> right at the same time. Take over his eyeball. Yeah. You want some of his brain? Too. Yeah, I know. There's <laughs> not much to share. Let me tell you. Okay. I'll take what you got. First line in the article. Do you see it, David? Wait, guys, David. Sorry. Right. <laughs> this set 771. You said one. You got the run. Three here. Yeah. So this year, 771. <laughs> We go back to the top of the article, which is I don't know where it is. So it, it, we're all working on a different. double dipper. <laughs> double it's nine thirty. Yeah. Oh, so, yes, yeah, so it'll be seven seven one six three three. Okay. So that will be the motion to approve um, Article Thirty One in the amount of seven seven one six three three. And would someone like to make that motion? Oh. Second. Second by Louise. Motion made by Dick. Um, I like the order we're going in now. Carol. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Barry. Yes. Josh. Yes. Carly. Yes. Louise. Yes. Dick. Yes. Karen. Yes. And the chair votes yes as well. Um, that brings us to Article 32, water system improvements. Mr. Chairman, uh, the actual article that will appear before town meeting will be different than what appears in the warrant. Um, that's just something that uh, I thought you know, my um, manager of you know, will be in here. The funding will still be $6.5 million. $2.5 million will be from water retained earnings, and $4 million will be from debt. If, if the committee may recall for several years in a row, we've been asked for why the water retained earnings, we've been keeping them high. And we said there were some major capital uh, projects coming forward. This is one of those major capital projects. And partly uh, uh, why we have $2.5 million retained earnings. 
And is there any money left in MWRA loan funding? There, uh, there is, uh, there is still uh, money available. Uh, it's not quite clear who will qualify for this, okay. but this is why uh, we still have a borrowing. Well, one, we need to have a borrowing because we don't have enough extra cash to do it. But two, certainly to leverage zero interest or even a grant loan program yeah. is always the first priority. But we would be uh, seeking funding from the MWRA if this project qualifies. Great, thank you. And then, go ahead. Oh, so what will be the balance of the water retained earnings, James? The water retained earnings will be approximately 2.9 if everything is recommended. Um, that's still hot. That's still hot, but we still have some other major water projects coming forward. But again, as I was just mentioned, which uh, Ms. Miller just asked about was seeing if we can leverage $3 from the MWRA. And if we were to do more cash for this, then the other project would have been called in. Mm -hmm. Another question, Marathon. Um, this is obviously the South Street from Charles River Street to Chestnut Street. So does that mean is that part two, part one will be the will be a part two where it goes from Chestnut Street over to either Devon Ave or to Great Plain Avenue? So no, that wasn't envisioned as part of the project. Um, this isn't the oldest uh, pipe that we have in town. It just happens to be one of the most problematic. It was when they were transitioning from techniques and materials from the older, more caustic, bad types of um, 1940s, 60s lead um, and switching to new materials. But unfortunately, the new materials did not um, do not have the seal quite the same way as the older materials did, and they were not necessarily installed in a way that hasn't had some movement, so there's breakage. Um, the reason we recommended it is because it's an area of town where we have a significant amount of water main breaks, um, so we wanted to address that. We do not have is the same issues from Dedham Ave um, all the way to Chestnut. How long is this project going to take, just out of curiosity? Um, what do you think? We we know right now that the materials themselves may have quite a significant lead time. Um, so we would not start the project until we had the materials ready, um, similar to what we did with Mark Street Central. How many months do you think it would take for execution? Okay, yeah. um, so because we have paving to do as well. So you're not going to line through the existing pipe. It's a removal of the existing pipe. And then so you have to do the diversion and right. then removal. So we're not going to be out every day for the year. I'm just yeah. Upset mm -hmm. the thing. yeah. Any questions or comments on that? <laughs> just pick on the recycle. No, actually, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> should be pipe instead of pie. And the text. Third line down. Yeah, I see it. I, 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 sorry. <laughs> It's like, what's pie? Let's go learn something yeah. new. <laughs> 3.3 <laughs> 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 weeks ago, right? Yeah. yeah. All right. Um, so, is there a motion with respect to Article um, 32? Second. Okay. Motion to approve um, by Jim, seconded by Louise. Um, any questions, comments? We'll come to a vote. Carol? Yes. Jim? Yes. Carol? Yes. Yes. Carly. Yes. Please. Oh, yes. Yeah. Tell me, Dick. Yes. Karen. Yes. Chair votes yes. All right. Um. We're getting there. We're going to do what the Tommy warrant. Um. Article ten and eleven. I think we can speak through together. Yeah, you speak together. Yeah. Sunday, but we've all got both. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. 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 So, David, you're going to speak to ten and eleven together. I am, um, and they are companion articles. The um, the town has. Um, as you're aware, there's Needham Cable and uh, Cable TV, and they exist uh, as a result of funding. A major funding source is uh, fees that the cable uh, providers collect and must permit 
to uh, for um, public educational and governmental access to uh, do broadcasting. The licenses that the select board have entered into are like board of select and now select board uh, over it's probably 50 years now in cable licensing. It was always recognized that these monies would be uh, would be remitted directly to the cable TV, um, you know, the cable TV entity. Several years ago, apparently the law was changed in the Department of Rec. I, I don't know that the law was changed. The Department of Red Revenue um, reinterpreted uh, how processes work. And what they say is the community should collect the money directly and then appropriate the money to the cable access. Uh, entity. And, uh, and of course, one of the concerns, understandably, is, uh, well, if these funds are coming in, and the only reason the cable companies are collecting this in order to promote the local cable television uh, studio and such, how do we ensure these monies are going to get there? And that's why they create this local acceptance, so it allows you to accept this fund, that when the monies come in, they go into the fund, so then they can be appropriated. Um, to the cable access um, of local TV station. So that's what 10 does. What 11 does is unfortunately another quandary of town finance versus the way the state envisions. The account that we're talking about, we have to first collect the money, have the money into the account before town means allowed to appropriate the money from there to the cable access. Problem is, the first year, there's no money in there because the money is coming in quarterly. So we basically need to appropriate the money to, uh, to, to spend to them during fiscal 24. Um, and hence, that's what this appropriation will do is, is to appropriate the money up front. We're not cutting the check to them. We cut the check to them as we receive the money from the three cable subscribers. So it's not like they're going to get an advance. They're not going to get any more than, uh, than what we actually collect. This is how much they received last year. And because, uh, because you never, they actually don't know what they're going to get until each quarter because it's based upon the number of subscribers that the different, that the three different entities have in terms of gathering those receipts. So uh, my estimate is 671.850. It will be paid out in the quarterly installments. It will be paid out only as the funds are received. And that's why this is, you're seeing that article. This is the only year uh, you'll see that article saying free cash in the future years will be by transfer. Question, Mr. Chair? Yes. This doesn't limit it though to the amount received. This says a sum. Uh, it will uh, say six, seven, one, eight, five. Okay. Zero. I'm I'm reading these every day and they're changing every yeah. day. Just like us. Okay. On that but but so there will be a specific, specific amount of money it will when it's voted upon, amount. and that specific amount of money will relate to the best projection we have, of, and Correct. based on last year's receipts. Based on their uh, last year's receipts, yeah. it's seventy-one thousand eight hundred fifty dollars. That will be the amount you will see in the wall. And if it's more than that, we have to appropriate the balance, or it'll just oh, it will be a town meeting vote in October. We'll certainly have a sense because we'll have okay. two quarters. And if it's less, what happens? It would close off free cash. No, if it's so if we if we, we, know if, if, all if, we if we get five hundred thousand right. instead of six hundred eighty one, yeah. right? It we're still going to have to appropriate six eighty one, right? Um. Uh, Okay, uh, I'm just focusing on FY24. This is in for yeah. FY24. Yeah. If we only receive 500,000, yeah. all we're going to pay to them is 500,000. In this example, there would be $171,850 left over. That would close out to free cash because this is only good for fiscal, uh, for the fiscal year. But this would require us to transfer the, mm -hmm. the 171. Well, the 500 plus the 171. No, the, the transfer is coming from free cash. The funding source for this 
for this particular year is free cash 671850. Okay, help and me out. I'm sorry to be difficult. This says we will oh, transfer an appropriate 671850 for appropriate to for the purpose of funding PEG. Right, so we're, we're appropriating it to ourselves so that we have the money, so that when the money comes in, we can give it to them. So but I'm if saying if, if only 500 comes in. Correct. They only get 500. That's okay. I don't think no, that's what this says. We've appropriated the ability to, to, give to them distribute up, up to, to 671. Right. 850. Or whatever the amount. Well, why don't we say be... up to? This uh, we will the loan the loan 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 loan. that way. They say you have to say a specific amount. You do the same thing in the operating budget, right. right? And then we don't spend to the last penny on the operating budget. Money comes back. Oh, okay. The same, it's the same concept. It's okay. Like, is every other line item that we think yeah. we're right. going to spend a certain amount? Yeah. So just to but follow this out, let's say we say the six seventy number. Yep. Five hundred comes in. That delta between the two then goes back into free cash. Yes, we close off the no, other. Like if, you know, if we get a million dollars comes in, I can't can... give them the million dollars. We have to go back to town meeting. Yeah, to get the that I understand. Yeah. It's like a revolving fund, basically. Well, yeah. roughly. A revolving fund that requires town meeting votes. So yeah. PEG revolving. <laughs> right. PEG. It's a special you revolving. Go PEG or PEG. Okay. 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 So that's nice. After these, after these votes, the time we need to take action. Yes, it'll be handled. Just out of curiosity, how is this GMS and where the change over like the last time we've been seeing because people have been freaking out. Oh, oh, they, they showed me a five year stream and it's been dropping. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, the revenue, now what's happening is people are, and Needham's on the unique town where you have three cable subscribers. So what they've seen is like one cable subscriber, the payments going down. But another one that the, the payments are going up. Who's third? Oh, Verizon. Other the, the RC and RC Verizon and you know the, um, Comcast or whatever their new names are. It's the name. it's so, Mr. Chair, I move, and beyond. I move that the finance committee um, recommend adoption of Lady Tilton articles ten yeah. and articles eleven. Second. Any further questions and comments? Hearing enough of the vote to recommend adoption of Article 10 and 11 in the special town meeting. Um, is on the floor. Carol? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Barry? Yes. Josh? Yes. Carl? Yes. And Louise? Yes. Dick? Yes. Aaron? Yes. Chair votes yes. Okay. Mr. Chairman, if I just may indulge you in the committee, here. Yes. We're going yeah. to Article 12 and 13, or no? Uh, no, it wasn't on the agenda. I would certainly speak to them if you want. It was on the agenda. I think we amended it. I was going to say that for the annual uh, for the annual town meeting warrant, special town meeting warrant, those articles that you have yet to take a vote, to take a vote recommendation to be made at town meeting. Okay. So that we can put it in the warrant for you. All right, let's, let's just, can we just do, Opioid. We did revise the agenda. So on the, on the opioid, oh, this is yeah. this allows more control over the yeah. opioid funds. So now Article 12 would allow us to automatically place all the funds into yeah. an opioid stabilization fund. The money couldn't come out unless it was voted on. So by town meeting. Correct. So uh Backing up a few weeks ago, I remember the presentation and concerns mm -hmm. about the opioid funds. But these are monies that are being received. Um, they must be spent for specific purposes. But because of the way the law is, they consider general funds and they will just close out the free cash and problematic. So, what this does is ensure that when the monies are now coming in, they're automatically going to be reserved specifically into this fund. They can only be expended, as Louise said, by a warrant article, which town meeting would have to approve with the funding coming out of it, which is currently has to require a two-thirds vote to transfer the money out. And Article 13 is, if you recall, the amount of money that we received to date in fiscal 2023, which was going to be the amount that was going to be funding the program right. that the um, Director of Health and Human Services was presenting. Well, now we just can put those monies directly into this fund. So 
town meeting will first establish and then second will appropriate into the reason why they need to appropriate into is this um, fund is only for uh, monies received after the creation date and these monies that are in article 13 we are already have in hand so that's the town meeting but nothing going to get spent Mm -hmm. but, uh, none of this is a spending situation. Right, right. This is a reservation right. only. And then all future spending will come through a town meeting warrant article mm -hmm. that will be presented with respect to what the requests are and then will be voted on by town meeting. That's mm -hmm. good. That, in order to spend any money that goes into this fund, it requires a, a warrant article and town meeting vote. And as a stabilization fund, it requires a two thirds. Mm -hmm. Carly, is that, um, I know that we had a discussion at that at the last meeting. Do you, does that process make sense to you? And do you have any questions about it? No, I, I think that that does make sense to me now. And I don't have any questions at this point. Yes. Right. Stabilization is spelled with an N. Yes, I know. The outgoing member of the select board did uh, appreciate the attempt of uh, Trying to introduce a foreign language. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just curious. We can't do it under the previous article with PEG. We had to come into the Treasury and then go out, but this can go direct. What's the difference? There are different statutes. The PEG is specifically designed for uh, those receipts. This the answer is, is it's different. Uh, but but this is the special stabilization fund, just like the capital yeah. improvement fund and the capital facility fund, the athletic stabilization fund. David, are these titles set in stone for the articles? I, I, I raise that because I think which that, which one do you think could be better? I, I both think that it should be the opioids settlement stabilization fund. I think the word settlement should be yeah. in there because I think uh, it, it just maybe eliminates some kind of confusion. Yep, yeah, it does. Um, yeah, I just think it's uh, for purposes of so if no one gets beyond the title, I think it's well, uh, the title. Yeah, I think I'll be helpful. Help. So I'll have that done on both of them. Okay. Thank you. And my understanding is they were multiple seven, right? Or but they're all, all, but they're all seven. So any uh, motion with respect to these two? Mr. So Chair, I move that the finance committee recommend adoption of special town meeting order warrant articles twelve and thirteen. Second for that? Second. Second by Dick. Any questions, comments, concerns? Here again, coming to vote, Carol. Yes. Yeah. Yes. All right. Yes. Sure. Yes. Carly. Yes. Louise. Yes. Dick. Yes. Karen. Yes. Chair votes yes. Okay. That was a lot. Mm -hmm. So I think they want to have a vote that said that any vote that we haven't taken, recommendation that we recommend that people will. Recommendation at town meeting. Yeah. Yeah. So that will go into the to the, the regular take a water for that and the special water. Well, so I, I would recommend that yeah. the past practice has been yeah. the finance many more. So moved. We're talking for that. Second. Okay. Any questions? I'll do a little Carol. Yes. Yeah. Jim. Yeah. Sure. Barry. Yes. God. Yes. <laughs> Barry. Yes. Louise. Yes. Dick. Yes. Karen. Yes. 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 Okay. Uh, any uh, matters people want to raise to the committee? As you know, our next meeting is going to be off-site. We're going to meet next Tuesday night here at 7 o'clock. Not here. No, no. 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 Confused. Yes. Right. So thank you for that. 7 o'clock at Rosemary? April 5th. 7th. 4th. April 4th. Where, where is that exactly? We can maybe talk um, about that offline or email. And I'm not sure. Rose, that is. You know, we'll get you the information. The Rosemary, the building in Rosemary Pool, the Rosemary Complex. Okay. I'll get it to you. Don't worry. I'll, don't worry. Uh, so it's Tuesday night uh, next week, only because of um, the holidays that um, start on Wednesday. So we are going to be meeting on Tuesday night. Um, it will not be meeting the following Wednesday night, and then we will be meeting the Wednesday the 19th. So I think hopefully between those two meetings, we'll be able to get everything wrapped up. I do not know if I'll be here on the floor. I yeah, I know there's people. There were, there were people. Yeah. It was a difficult situation. Yeah. We had, you know. No, 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 no. I just want to make sure from a forum perspective. Yeah, I, I think. Yeah, I, I cannot be there on the fourth either. 
Okay. We're down to five. So okay. Five yeah. practice. I should be able to be there. And you're saying that the um, I'm sorry, the twelfth we won't meet, but we'll meet on the nineteenth. Correct. Yes. Uh -huh. Thank you. All right. Any further business? Yeah, Mr. Chair. Since I can't be here, the CPC will be coming back again. I think at the next meeting. Right. I'm troubled by something in the write up, and if I'm the only one, that's fine. We can regard it, disregard it, or if others are troubled, I I volunteer it. That the criteria for decision making refers to three criteria, the last of which is worthiness. I have no idea what worthiness means as they've used it. And I'm, I think that's not a very good guidance for a decision making process. So I would recommend that they be encouraged to come up with another term like significance for the town, you know, something, but worthiness, I have no idea what that means. I, yeah, I wouldn't agree with one. Another thought I had is, to, and I don't know whether this is relevant or not, but on the open space, it's. I wonder if there is any learning or as to what the appropriate ratio in a town is for open space versus revenue generating properties. And is that something that gets factored into the decisions at all? Good question. We'll, uh, we'll carry this forward next week. Okay. Thank you, Dick. For that. Okay, anything else? Um, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. Okay. Motion to adjourn by Jim, seconded by Dick, and we'll finish up around the horn. Um, an honor of opening day tomorrow, Carol? Yes. Yeah. Yes, Barry. Yes. Oh. Yes. Harley? Yes. Jerry? Louise? Yes. Dick? Yes. Karen? Yes. Care votes, yes. We are adjourned. Thank you, everyone.